Thank you, guys. Amen. Amen. We're going to get ready to worship, so if you guys would like to stand up, and for those online, you guys can stand up and stretch too. You know, we can give our battles to Jesus, and as we do that and we worship, it increases our faith to move mountains. Amen. So let's go ahead and do that this morning. You guys put your hands together and help us worship. Here we go.
All right, guys. Welcome, welcome. Hey, have a seat for a second while I just chat with you. Get a little exercise, a little up and down. Isn't that a good thing? It is a good thing, by the way. So glad you guys are here. Welcome to Community Life Church. I'm Pastor Gordon. It's just a joy to be able to gather, kind of not gather together, right? It's an awesome thing to be able to be here uh, with you. And those that are watching online, thank you so much for tuning in and being a part as best as you possibly can. Appreciate you being there. If you're new to us uh, for watching or you're being in person here, please go on our website at Community Life Church, mycommunitylifechurch.org, and fill out the New Here card. We'd love to know that you were part of us today. Hey, we got something incredible happening this Saturday, August 22nd. Uh, Family Life is doing something known as a back pl- backpack blessing. Say that three times fast, huh? Backpack blessing. Such an incredible opportunity for us to be able to pray over our families, praying over teachers, praying over our communities as we get together uh, in individual time slots from one to four uh, out here in the front yard. And we're just going to pray over each other. Um, We were just kind of joking this week. We were talking about different activities we could do, do. And they said, you know what? We're not here to play. We're here to pray. And that's a powerful way to send our families into this new school year. So check out um, the website, check out our social media platforms, and you'll get some information there. Now, into this next song, uh, we love to give in a celebratory way where we give as we sing, give uh, as we worship in song, and our worship is also as we share the resources that God has provided for us. So here's an opportunity now in just a moment. If you're in-house, you can come forward on the altars here. And you can uh, get, put your gift right there, your offering, your tithe. If you're watching online or even in-house here, as I do, you can do text to, uh, text to give. Uh, you can also go online and do reoccurring. Lots of ways to remain obedient in our giving. Now, hey, let's stand back up and let's worship with our words and worship with our sharing. Aren't you encouraged this morning that Jesus is here and that he accepts our offering this morning, that he multiplies it for his good? Let's continue to worship him. Your triumph unfolds. He 
He's never failing. He's never failing. will surely keep your promise to me that I will rise in your victory. Yes. And you who hold the stars, who call them each by name, will surely keep your promise to me that I will rise in your victory. Your triumph unfolds. He's never failing. He's never failing. Take courage, my heart. Stay steadfast, my soul. He's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. Hold on to your hope as your triumph unfolds. He's never failing. He's never failing. You never fail. You never fail. He's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. He's in the Thank you, Jesus. He's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. Oh, there's 
nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You get beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn morning to dancing. You get beauty for ashes. Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who cares. You're the only one who cares. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing that's better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you, oh, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways, you're the only one who cares. You turn graves into gardens, you turn bones into armies, you turn seas into highways, you're the only one who cares. You're the only one who cares. You're the only one who cares. Lord, we are so humbled to be in your presence this morning. In the words of that song, church, we are in that time where we need God to turn the bones into armies. We are in chaos. The world, the news, would have us to be afraid. They would have us to be anxious. They would have us to sideline the church, to sideline Jesus Christ. But Lord, we come before you this morning. We boldly approach your throne, and we thank you for the victory that we already have in your Son, God. We love you, Lord. We come to you, and we ask you to breathe life into this church to bring life into our dry bones, our scared bones, our anxious bones, our doubting bones. Father, we come before you and we ask you to breathe life into us this morning. God, we are headed into the unknown. School's about to start. People have job concerns, money concerns, health concerns with the virus. But God, we ask for that fresh breath into us, Lord. Liven us up. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Not us, but you, God. Move in this place. Move in our hearts, God. Help us to draw closer to you in our walk with you, Lord. We, we ask for special blessings this morning for teachers, for parents, for students, for our culture, Lord, our communities. God, help us to go out from this place to be the church. Lord, whatever we came in here with this morning, God, help us to leave it at your feet. You deal with it, Lord. Uh, we're going to talk about Pastor Brenda later this morning and what a blessing she's been to our lives, God, and I'll never forget what she said to me. Be obedient to God and leave the consequences to Him. God, let us be obedient to you this morning. 
And we'll let you deal with the rest, Lord. We trust you and we love you. We thank you, Father. And we ask all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. <clears throat> Well, good morning, everybody. Man, here we are. You glad to be here today? Let me hear it. That's great. It's so great to be a part of God's family. It's so great to be a part of uh, being in, uh, in this place together. It's great to be able to kind of gather, not gather, right? Uh, so that's kind of a cool thing. Hey, so today we're going to be going through Ephesians chapter 4. I know that uh, there are six chapters in Ephesians. We've done one and two, and so for my melancholies, that means three comes next, uh, but three is actually capitalizing on one and two and reinforcing that. So you probably read it. Thank you. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about Ephesians chapter four, and uh, so you can go ahead and get that ready in your Bible, your mobile device, pull it up on your computer as you're watching, however you want to do it, perfectly good. Let's talk just for a moment about last week. Last week, we talked about something uh, rather significant known as reconciliation, and I want to share with you briefly just kind of what God has done uh, for me in this past week with regards to reconciliation, and I'm hoping, and I'm praying, and I'm believing that somehow, some way, you have taken a step toward that idea, that concept of reconciliation. So last week, we were, we were talking, we were praying, doing the whole next steps, right? I was explaining that, and then we went to our last song. And at the end of the second service, during that last song, I sat over here, my little makeshift bullpen there, and uh, started praying, God, what would you have me do? What would you have me do in, in my situations? What would you have me do? And as I'm sitting there, I have my eyes closed and my head bowed, right? And we're, we're, we're praying, we're singing, and, I, and it, real big and bold, the word still came to my mind. And then it just kind of like faded over to the word be. And it just simply, God reminded me to be still. And he said very clear to me, very clear to me, someone will contact you. And I said, and so I took a moment in my, in my intelligence to educate my father in heaven, to remind him, because maybe he wasn't paying attention, that you understand that somebody to come to me would mean that they would either have to be in this room or they would have to be intentionally watching online. God, did you know that? How often do you have to educate God on things you think he missed or things that you think he's not paying attention to? I bet a lot of people would say, God, did you, hey, we got this thing down here called COVID. Are you paying attention, right? We think that we need to educate God, so I educate God. And, um, and he probably, I'm sure he's laughing. I'm sure he's laughing like, <laughs> yes, Gordon. And so I said, you understand that? He goes, yes, just be still. And so just after one o'clock, I received a text message. And it said, thank you so much for the message. Thank you so much for your encouraging words and sharing your heart. It really meant so much. And then on Monday, I responded with, hey, thanks for the encouragement. And almost immediately after that, I got a call. Reconciliation. Reconciliation, that process where we just pour ourselves out to God and say, how, are we, how am I supposed to do this? And he tells me, I don't know about you, but he told me just to wait. And that started process. So I got to ask you, I got to ask you a question. What about you? What happened this week to take you one step closer to the idea of reconciliation. And I want you to think through that. I want you to really truly think through what have you intentionally done to be able to help the process of reconciliation. I love what Matt prayed, you know, just be obedient to God and leave the consequences to him. I've heard Pastor Brenda say that so many times and it's so true. We just need to we just need to be obedient to God. And if he has asked you to do something, then you need to get that courage. You need to pray for that courage and boldness to go and do that reconciliation because it's so important. And it capitalizes on to today. today. The title for today's message is just simply Better Together. We just do things better together. It, you know, many hands make light work. 
when people are all praying together, amazing things can happen. Not to say that the prayer of a few or one isn't powerful. It just means that when the church comes together, the world changes, man. And so the church needs to be the church as a real family. So we have talked in such a way over the past couple weeks of Ephesians chapter 1 and 2, and uh, 3 is kind of capitalizing on that as well. And we're going to be looking at our outline in just a minute. But understand this, when we have community life, real, authentic, legitimate community life, not a church name, but an experience as a church family, we can stand strong together. You can stand strong in an amazing, phenomenal way. There's a lady that lives in the community. She's been here one time. She has a son who has uh, many uh, physical challenges, and so the one time that he was here, somebody had to go pick them up, help him into the chair, and get him in here. It was very, very challenging, but this person did this. We've stayed connected ever since, and she reached out to me this week, and she said, hey, do you know anybody that can, can do these things? And I put it out on Facebook. Is there anybody that knows how to, like, we got somebody that needs, like, a handyman, she, she has funds to be able to pay, but we need somebody that will be willing to go over there and help and guide. And because she connected, even in a distance, for, to a community of some sort, she was able to get the help that she needed. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It's wonderful to be able to see how people come together, and we're seeing it more and more and more, where we're having conversations, or we're trying to have conversations, right? Where we're trying to come together to be the church. And when the church is the church, amazing things happen. Now, uh, outline for Ephesians, we've just spent two weeks talking about the wealth of the believer. Be, uh, we're wealthy because of our Father in heaven, because of forgiveness, and because of our family. We're, we're wealthy because of that. For the next two weeks, we're going to be focusing on specifically with regards to the walk of the believer. And, and uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful view of God's plan for redeeming people, all of Ephesians. Now, Ephesians, we know, is written by the Apostle Paul. He was in jail, again, and, uh, and he's writing this. Either he wrote it out or he had somebody scribe it, but Paul's writing this. And we start off with the wealth of the believer. This is who you are in Christ. And now we're going to go on. Even in the very first verse of this portion of the letter, he even says, therefore, indicating that, listen, I have, tell, I have told you and shared with you what, your wealth as a believer now, this is how you walk it out. All too often, people don't understand who they really are in Christ. When you have a father who has adopted you into a family, has unlimited resources, unlimited love, unlimited compassion, and unlimited capability, we need to act like it. You need to live like it. Stop emphasizing your weaknesses and start capitalizing on your strengths. Allow God to work through those things, to do incredible things through your life. We are wealthy as believers, but now what do we do? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul goes into this and he says, Now therefore, you're wealthy. Now how do we apply it? I, a prisoner of, for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. Your calling as a believer. And there's different ways that plays out, but when you look at the fact that you're actually part of this family, this family of God, that's, that, that's a calling into His family. Like God draws you to Himself, for you have been called by God. So you should live a life that is worthy of that. Live a life that is consistent with that. Live a life that honors your Father in heaven. It's not one of those situations that, well, I'm, I'm aware of it, but I just, you know, God and I have a deal. God and I have an understanding. What you know should impact how you grow. What you know should impact how you grow. It's not just hearing the Word, but also doing the Word. For you just to come in, Scripture is very clear, for you to come in, hear it, or be at home reading it and not do anything is just like looking at yourself in the mirror and being like, hey, there you are, and then walking immediately away and forgetting what you looked like. Seems ridiculous, right? So then why would we spend our time hearing the Word if we're not going to do anything about it? Then just stop. Stop listening, stop reading, stop trying. You're not doing it anyway. If anything, you're, hard, you're hardening your heart every time you hear it and refuse to do it. You're actually flexing your rejection muscle. You're, you're, you're actually priming yourself to be able to say no easier. 
So it would be better for your spirit for you to stop hearing if you're not going to do. Because what happens is that you get into the fact of, oh yeah, I, I heard this, I heard this, and I heard that, so I must be good. That's not how it works. We are already received by God, and so therefore we behave like it. We don't have to behave to be received. We're already received. Now, this, uh, this section of, of Ephesians chapter 4 we're going to be talking about has to do with walking with believers. Basically, how do I get along with my siblings in Christ? How do I get along with that person next to me? How do I get along with that person across the room from me? How do I get along with other believers? And I think this is a message that all churches need to know and need to hear because there's so many debates in churches today over this and over that. People want this, people want that, and I'm just over all of that. I'm not interested in another discussion about a preference. I'll have all the conversations we want about what does the Word of God say? Let's see, but what did Jesus say about this? You know, let's talk about those. Let's really emphasize those things to be able to reach a world that is lost. But to be divided is just not healthy. To be divided amongst ourselves. You know, there's people that are in person because you're comfortable being here. There's people that are watching online because they're not ready yet. You're still family in fact, you should go online today, and, and even if you don't rewatch the whole thing, like go through some of the comments and, and do some encouraging things there. Just encourage people because you may be able to get together, and that's a beautiful thing, but these people aren't ready for that yet. Some have really young kids that the kids won't be able to handle that, right? And so our family is everywhere. So how do we do this? How do we walk with believers? Well, first of all, it starts in um, Ephesians 4, verse 2. Always be what? Why oh, is that so hard for you to spit out, right? <laughs> um, humble. I, I got to be humble, right? So it says always be humble, which is kind of a command there. And so if it's, if it's something that we're told to do, then it's something that we can do. Well, I'm not really much of a humble person. Or maybe you think you are, but you're really not. You can choose humility and gentleness in every situation. So Paul says, always be humble and gentle. When you're interacting with each other as believers in Christ, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. It's basically giving somebody the benefit of the doubt. There's people in your life that you have not reconciled with yet that you refuse to give the benefit of the doubt. You may not realize that you're not giving them the benefit of the doubt, but every time they do a thing, it's compiled onto the last thing they did to upset you and frustrate you. So that's how you know you have not reconciled. That's how you know that you are not making every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit even, that you're not making any allowances for the other's faults. You'll excuse your faults left and right. Well, actually, it really wasn't even my fault. Like this happened or that happened or this or that. And we'll give ourselves all kinds of leeway. But when other people do it, especially those that are different than us, that we don't like, or that are sometimes mean, we don't give them any, any allowances. We just say, add it on to their tab. When you add it to their tab, you're being the judge. You are not called to be the judge. I am not called to be the judge. There is one judge, and it is not you. It is not me. Jesus is the perfect, the righteous judge. He'll sort it out. You keep doing what you're supposed to be doing with people that call themselves believers. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. So you're actually stuck together. You're actually held together in the bonds of peace that you choose to sometimes have to say, listen, let's just agree to disagree. Can we just do that? And then you just acknowledge the fact that we are going to live in peace. We're not going to cause trouble. We're not going to cause issues. We're going to live in peace. For there is one body, one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. It's all one. It's all one. There is one Lord, verse 5, one faith, one baptism, one God, one and one Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. So back in verse 4, it says, there is one body. It's the idea that 
Does everybody have hands? I'm just one. Some people don't. I don't know. All right, put your hands together. Come on, the kids. Will, kids, help me with this. You've got to teach the adults how to be fun. And so, um, kids, we'll do this together. You got your hands right. Can you clap? Right. Thank you. Thank you. And okay. Now, what if these hands went at odds? Right. Don't do this because you'll slap somebody next to you. You would. You totally would. Right. Okay. Now, how am I supposed to clap? We're more, more likely to go find somebody else. Hey, can I use your hand? And you're trying, have you ever tried to clap with somebody? Put to the person next to you, somebody you live with that you're comfortable touching, and then I want you to try to clap their hand. You are a hot mess. That's all I'm saying is you guys are a hot mess. Because you're going over here going, no, it's okay. I'm mad at them, so I'm not going to deal with this part of the body. I'm going I'm to just go over here and try to find something else to be able to make that work because I don't actually need this part. Well, what are you saying, Pastor? We are all part of the same body, Christ being the head of the body. And so if you don't reconcile and try to figure out how to be bonded in peace, then the hands and the feet of Christ will be at odds, and they won't be able to function and even worship God effectively. So somehow, someway, you may have found that you need to reconcile, but you're not willing to. Then you need to truly Talk to God about that and figure out how in the world can you do that? How can you reconcile? And as we talked about last week, reconciling even with those individuals that have passed away, figuring it out, out a way to either write a letter that you just simply can't send to them or having a prayer time uh, talking to God about it. You can still reconcile either way. But the idea is that, especially as believers that are here together, we need to figure out ways to reconcile with one another, even if the relationship isn't what it used to be or that it's not a super tight-knit thing. At least it can be valuable and it can be bonded in peace. Therefore, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and the Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. God is God, and you're not and I'm not. Man, I tell you what, I'm glad I'm not God. Me and Pastor Brenda used to tease that it would be, (laughs) that pastors should have like six justifiable homicides a year. (laughs) Because you deal with some crazy people. You deal with some crazy people and say, well, thank God that we're not him. Because there'd probably be like, I'd be even more of a mess. Other people wouldn't be here, right? It'd just be an interesting thing. The idea is that God is He is who's over all, in all, and living through all, because that's who He is. He has a picture on life that you don't, that I don't. So then in in, in verses 7 through 11, they go through talking about the, um, the gifts that are given to the church. They talk about apostles, prophets, evangelists pastors, teachers, and trying to, trying to explain, listen, these, these individuals, these are gifts that God has given you to be able to do what? Well, in verse 12, it makes it very clear. What is the purpose of these gifts? Their responsibility. Now, there is referring to apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility. So, you help uh, give you a, a, more of a glimpse into my responsibility. As a pastor, my responsibility to the church is this. Their responsibility is to equip. If you are not being equipped, I am not doing my job. If you are truly acting on, following, next steps, doing, doing your part to grow and to get to that, my job is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church. Not the church locally, but the church globally, the church actually eternally, the church of Jesus Christ, to build up the church. It's not all about us right here on the corner of 532 and Curtis. We are part of a much bigger family of God. Now, we gather in smaller numbers. We're able to get together and we get to know each other. That's a beautiful thing. But understand, you are truly part of the kingdom of God, which is also part of your wealth as a believer. So my responsibility is to equip you. So there's times now, and I'm kind of learning a little bit of this because God is shifting me, just like he's probably shifting you in this this new season of life, this season of living. And somebody might say to me, hey, would you be willing to go visit so-and-so? What I want to start doing here is, and if I could just be real with you, I want to ask you, have you visited them? 
I'm just asking. I'm not saying I'm unwilling. I'm just saying if I have eight people come to me and say, will you visit this person? Now I have eight stops. But if every person that asks me to visit somebody actually takes the responsibility themselves as a follower of Christ to go and do that, then guess what? You are the hands and feet of Christ just like I am. And my job is to equip you to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that from time to time I'm not going to stop by, that I won't have a prayer with somebody, that if in their passing moments that I won't be there. But you understand you can do this. You can do this. You don't need me to be there with you. You've got the Son of God in spirit with you doing this. You can make it happen, follower of Christ. You can. And I'm going to do everything I can moving forward to ensure that you have every opportunity to be equipped to do the work of God. You know, I have conversations with people from time to time, lots of people, and I appreciate you all so much asking, how are you doing? You doing okay? Everything going okay? I've even had people say that they're losing sleep over situations in my life. And I'm going, am I doing something wrong? Am I doing something wrong? Because when I lay down to go to sleep, I lay down to go to sleep. Like, I, unless, unless the Lord himself wakes me up to do something, uh, which doesn't always happen, or if I just have a moment of fear that I have to kind of pray away. But I just, don't, I just don't have all these worries and the weights. You know, so many pastors have taken the, the, the everybody from the congregation, right, the flock that they are shepherding, and all those weights rest upon the pastor. And then pastor after pastor falls into some sort of moral trouble or they get burnt out. And I say, man, I wonder... Maybe I'm doing this pastor thing wrong because I'm enjoying it. You know, like I've been in pastoring in some form since 2005 from leading with youth groups and then moving into different areas of family life ministries and doing a variety of different things. And I got to tell you, every, every different thing that God has placed me in, I've enjoyed. And people say, oh man, it's so hard. And it's so, yeah, there's a lot of weight that goes on you if you internalize it all. But I know my responsibility, and my responsibility is to empower you, not to entertain you. And so I want you to live your fullest life. It's a waste of our time for you to come here or watch online and then not be equipped. You'd be better off watching something else or something more entertaining or flashier, to be honest with you. Because the idea is that you become equipped for the work of God. I mean, don't you want to have a life of purpose and of fulfillment and something that just, just drives you and motivates you in your faith? Something that when all this chaos surrounds us, you're not torn down by it. You actually rise up through it. You become stronger from it. That's what I long for you as a pastor and as a teacher. And that's my role. Now, that's how we get along with each other. Right? You got that? File that away. So next time you have a moment, be, always be humble, always be gentle, always be patient with each other, giving allowances for their faults, because the person sitting next to you is, it has faults. I know, I know it's kind of crazy to think, right? You mean, <laughs> he, certainly he's not talking about me. Don't look at me, right? Don't look at me. You have faults. People you live with have faults, we have faults. But we need to give them the same grace we give ourselves. We're willing to say, I'm ah, not a big deal. Oh, it was, must have been somebody else, something else. Give them lots of grace. Now, walking with believers, here's how we walk before unbelievers. Here's how this happens, because we know how to, be, how to treat and behave that way. But what about somebody who's watching our lives and wondering, what is this all about? Well, Paul says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as Gentiles do, for they are um, hopelessly confused. If you have been attending church or reading your Bible for 30 years, 40 years, whatever, and you find yourself in a constant state of confusion, I'm here to tell you something's wrong. Something is desperately wrong because you are still living as an unbeliever. That's what they're talking about with the whole idea of like, don't live like Gentiles any longer. We're talking about the idea of being unbelievers. Don't live like somebody who doesn't have the wealth of a believer. Live like somebody who does. Live like it. Own it. 
Acknowledge it. Be confident in it. Me and my cousin Brian used to hang out a lot. We used to spend a lot of time together. And Brian, as the older he got, the more solid he got. It's like concrete drying, man. The more solid he got. And he was always at least two or three inches taller than me, I think. He's just a big dude, right? And, and, uh, and he wasn't blessed with the gift of gab. Fortunately, <laughs> I was. And so we would go out to different places. And anytime I was with him, I just knew that I was going to be okay. Because people knew that he was with me, and they weren't about to mess with him, and they knew that he was my family and how we stuck together. And so I had the, I had the, uh, the privilege, the opportunity, the ignorance in mind to say things that I wouldn't normally say if I was by myself to people, because I knew who I was with. Now, of course, that's kind of a silly example, but at the end of the day, have you ever been in that situation where you feel more confident when you're with certain people? You are with the God of the universe. Jesus, the one that conquered death, lives in you, believer. And the spirit that guides you and that helps you. You need to live like that. And others can see that. So we don't want to be confused. Going on to verse 22. So throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. There is no gray area there, man. We want to throw off that sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on the new nature created to be like God. So here's the imagery that we got here. Um, whenever, Whenever you'd go back to school, did anybody go shopping before you go back to school? Raise your hand. Let me see. Go shopping, right? And get some new kicks, right? You get some shoes. You get some new... Some new tennis shoes, right? You get some new tennis shoes, and, uh, and you get some new clothes. And something happened when you took it, because you couldn't wear the old clothes, right? If you were the one that would go shopping, and you'd put on the new clothes, and you'd walk into school, right? And you'd have a little strut in your step. I don't know how to strut, but I would imagine it kind of look a little bit like this. And then you'd walk in there, and I, used, I would get shoes, and I'd get white shoes, that's the dumbest thing they ever created in the world is white shoes. That's why I wear black shoes now. And I got white shoes on, and, and, and it didn't matter. I would wear them for 15 seconds, and then my shoes were looking for a scuff. They were like, we cannot be this white. We need to be scuffed up. And so I would get a little scuff. My shoes would get dirty, and I would sit at home with a toothbrush. I am not kidding you. This, is, this was what I did as a kid. I didn't have many friends, apparently. And I would brush my my shoe with a toothbrush not mine it was an extra one and i would brush it with like some bleach or whatever and i'd get real shiny oh that looks so good and um the idea is that i i wouldn't put those new clothes over old clothes especially now in our day and age we've got healthcare workers that are going home and they're like stripping down in their garage and then they're going directly into the shower and they're cleaning completely and they're removing those clothes and they're gone and they're putting on brand new stuff they don't hold on to any of it because they don't want to contaminate anybody that they are around or that they're living with the same is true believer with those of us who claim the name of Jesus we are supposed to remove our sinful nature and put it aside altogether, and we put on this new nature, which is brand new, fit for us specifically. We are not to hold on to that, well, you know what, I do like those old shoes, or I like those old socks, or I like, these are just comfortable shorts, and no, no, all that old stuff needs to go away, and something new is created inside of you. That's the imagery where the old thing is taken off, and a new thing is put off, and and it's created to be like God. Truly righteous and holy. Truly righteous and holy. That is your calling as a believer in Christ to be truly righteous and holy. We were dead and now we are alive. That's the difference, light and dark. The dramatic difference. And there should be a difference in your life. There should be such a difference in your life. It may not be an overnight thing and it most likely won't be. But there should be a point in time where people look and go, man, you're you're different. You're different. You're not like I remember you. That should empower you. Believe it or not, I've actually had people say to me, I liked it better when you were drinking. I've had people say that to me. It's been many years, but I've had people actually say, I really, I just, 
I don't like this. And really what people are saying when that happens is that they're feeling a level of conviction too. And they're going, well, maybe I should be different. Maybe I should follow Jesus in my life. But they're not interested in taking off the old nature and putting on the new. They just want to keep doing what they've always done. And that's a hard thing to hear, right? I liked you better when you were away from God. That's hard. Anybody who's following Jesus will not say that. If somebody says that they claims Jesus, I doubt it. <laughs> I liked you better when you, didn't, when you were away from I liked you better when you were dead in sin on your way to hell. <laughs> well, I'm not going back there. <laughs> not drinking from that cup again, sorry. And, and so people, just, people that don't know don't get it. So how are we supposed to behave here? We want to throw this off? Because the idea is that it's one thing to take the believer out of the world, which is salvation, but it's another thing to take the world out of the believer, which is sanctification. Sanctification is this idea that we're being set apart. Salvation is that immediate moment of which Jesus comes into your life, fills you with the Holy Spirit, and you are on your way to heaven, right? You get that moment like salvation. I am choosing to follow Jesus. It's a choice. Here I go. But, and then there's that moment. And, and so, but, but there's a life process almost of this sanctification where you're being set apart for the good work that God has for you, where he's working with you and guiding you and molding you and discipling you. There's a process. So he says in verse 25, stop telling lies. Is there any confusion on that? I got people that say lies about me. It is what it is. And I appreciate the people in my life that give me so much respect that come to me and ask me, is this true? And I have the opportunity to respond. Stop telling lies. Stop telling lies. If, you don't, if it's not your story to tell, don't tell it. If you don't know all the details, don't preface it with, I really don't know all the details, but what I heard was, that's how you know you're about to go down a slippery slope. And as a follower of Christ, we are not called to do that. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you, which means you can be angry without letting it control you. Don't let the sun go down on it while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. What does this mean as, as an imagery? Uh, the idea is that when you get mad, now track with me for a minute, when you get mad, do you or do you not think of things you would never do? Come on, you pictured yourself with that baseball bat, right? You pictured yourself flooring the gas. You pict I'm just being real. You pictured something... It went in your mind. Now, whether that was your thought or the devil's thought, I'm not, I'm not blaming or shaming. I'm keeping us accountable and equipping us. You had a thought in your anger, and some people that acted out in their anger did punch that wall, broke their hand. Some people that did act out in anger did do things they shouldn't have done. We call it road rage. So think about this. Your anger invites things into your mind and your heart and your spirit that you should never do. So as soon as that moment happens, right, if you do not handle it, don't let the sun go down on you while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Meaning that when you get angry and you start entertaining those thoughts, there's a door to your soul that kind of opens up. The devil puts his foot uh, in that door because he's trying to get in, and he's been trying to get in, believer, uh, since the moment you declared Jesus as your Lord, he's been trying to get back into that process and trying to keep you away from that. So he puts his foot in the door, and if you don't deal with the foot in the door, the door stays open and could eventually open more and more and more to where you give full permission to the destructive elements of the devil in your life. Because, and it all goes back to reconciliation. Because when you get mad at somebody, you've got to offer forgiveness and you've got to figure out how to reconcile those moments. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Easy enough, right? If you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, for good hard work and, give, and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. 
This is that time where you're sitting at a coffee shop and you're having a conversation or you're sitting anywhere having a sandwich and you start sharing stories. And you're with a safe person, two, two Christians, two believers, two followers of the way who are talking and all of a sudden you think it's safe enough to share kind of an, kind of an off-color joke, so to speak, or something that you wouldn't share in front of a group of people or you're trying to hide it but you're trying to share it because that's actually part of your old nature you're trying to put back on a little bit of, and then you share it. And I, and I have been so guilty of this, where I don't, I don't typically share the, the joke. I'm not, not aware of the last time I've ever done that, but I, I do have a very hard time of kind of shutting that down. And so somebody will say it, I'll kind of laugh and joke it off and move on. Whereas believers, our words should be encouraging to each other and to those who hear it so that they understand that there's something different about us. Truly, we make, we make bad choices, we mess up. This is not a shaming thing, this is an accountability thing. When we speak, we should speak life. We should not speak anything that is, that is uh, foul or abusive in any of our language. We should be a blessing to those who are around us, constantly encouraging the family of God. And then those who are amongst us, who are not believers yet, will hear it, and they'll be a blessing to it. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit uh, by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as, as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. You don't think it's a big deal to live differently than the way God instructs us to or to act differently? Think about this, parents. Have you ever been humiliated by your child in public? Was that kind of a big deal? It's kind of a big deal, wasn't it? And it grieves the parent. When we live in such a way that dishonors God, it grieves our parent. And we're not supposed to behave like that. It's not a rule of, it's not rules and lists of do's and don'ts. It's a way of living that helps you experience your most fulfilling life. Now, if you'll be honest enough to say, well, I'm not really interested in a fulfilling life, I'm not interested in a life of purpose, well, then just be honest. Don't try to play this game. You're either in or you're out. That doesn't mean you're not going to have speed bumps along the way, but you're always fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. That's what that looks like. Now, something I want to share with you as we wrap up here today is something called the path of the disciple. The path of the disciple is a continual thing, and it involves our mission. Our mission at Community Life is to love learn, and lead. It is not cyclical in the sense that you would go loving, okay, now I'm going to learn, I'm going to leave love, I've got, okay, I'm going to go on to learn, then I'm going to go on to lead. It's not that, it's something that's a continual, that you're doing all of them at the same time, whether you realize it or not. And you should be loving continually, learning continually, and you should be leading well continually. Well, I don't really have anybody to lead. Ah, but when you're at that sandwich shop, when you're down at the Wildcat, or some of those people that go to Las Penas, I don't know, but there's some people that go over there, I, I, but you're sitting over there and, and you're talking, loving, learning, leading, you lead by the way you talk, even to the waitresses and the waiters. You lead in the way you treat them and each other. You're always, believer, you're always doing it somehow. You're either loving well or not, learning well or not, and leading well or not, all at the same time. And so we learned that through allowing us, our, we rely on the Spirit. So let me show you something here. A friend of mine in Canton, Michigan, um, first met this pastor, Pastor Nathan, in Massillon uh, when he was actually part of a church down there as a campus pastor. And uh, I got to know him years ago when I would go down there. I was part of a leadership team for the denomination at that time. And we just got to know each other a little bit here, a little bit there. We just, but God had connected us enough to know each other and understand a little bit. And so he had been working on something I had no idea about over for the past decade, greater than the decade, maybe about 11 years even, he had been working on this um, life journey map. And this is something that he has entrusted to me to be able to use and also entrusted to anybody that wants it. He just gives it freely. He has not branded this thing with anything from the church he serves at because he wants everybody to be able to use it and grow from it. So I give him full permission, though he said, you don't even have to talk about me. I am so grateful for the work he has put in, and now he's allowing me to be a part of the work that he's doing. 
So I want to share with you for a minute um, this uh, life journey map. Trev, can you make sure that this is in that picture there? Trevor's taking the production team by storm, man. My 11-year-old is over there, you know, doing, the, doing the, the, the notes and stuff and the lyrics. Now he's on camera, man. I'm telling you what, he's going to run the show. He's going to put me out of a job. I know it. And so you look at here, here's what this, this uh, life journey map is all about. Of course, our mission is loving, learning, and leading in all of it. At some level, at some fashion, you get, this, is what, this is what we're doing in, in, in every area of our life. Now, the life journey involves before Jesus and after Jesus because it's your whole life journey. So this is something I'm not passing out to everybody, but I am hoping that we'll be able to raise up some people that can learn it and then teach other people what that means because I want to equip you for the work of the Lord. So here's what, this is where you need to decide where you are. You're on this map. You're on this map. You may be somewhere that you didn't realize you were. So let's talk through this for a moment. At the beginning of our life journey, we actually start out dead. We are spiritually dead. Uh, we are not alive in Christ. We are slaves to sin. That's actually part of the journey. Everybody experiences that at the very beginning. In those moments, the individual um, that, would be, that would be encouraging this person or trying to reach this person would be sharing your story and sharing God's story. Like just sharing, you know, just kind of sharing a little bit about what God's doing in my life. Wow, you're different. Tell me about that. Well, this is what God has done in my life. And you share that with an individual. Um, so you might be somebody who's actually not quite even um, saved yet. Then the individual that chooses to follow Jesus with their life and their words and says, listen, I'm going to follow Jesus. Then they become an infant. And that's where you start sharing your life and sharing truths and sharing your habits with this individual. You start actually inviting them more into your life, even more, and maybe they already were a lot in your life, but it's possible that maybe not so much just yet. But here's the reality. We want to invite them into our life, and we want to share truths and habits, truths that you have learned, truths and habits that you have acquired. Well, how are, how are you doing it? Well, here's how I do it. It may work for you, it may not, but here's how I do it. Then the idea is that we move uh, from dead into infant, infant into a child, and as a child, we begin to connect them to God, connect them to God's family, and connect to God's purpose. So there's, and sometimes this wheel can go quickly, and sometimes it may go really slow, but the idea is understanding where you are so you know where you need to go. This is very similar to raising a child, isn't it? You have an infant that just is entirely dependent on the parent. And the parent section is the one that would be doing the discipling. And so you have an infant, then you go into a child, and you're trying to help this individual now start making decisions in their own faith. Start making their decisions. This is a spiritual child, of course, and so trying to understand what that looks like for them in their life based on what they have shared the truths of God's Word, and the habits that they have learned from, from the Father. Are you tracking with me? So we have somebody who, is, who was dead in Christ, now alive in Christ as an infant, into a child. Now they move into a young adult. As a young adult, the goal is to become confident, become the mission, and become whole. You are so confident in who you are as a child of God that you are growing in that, and you're now a young adult where you're now able to move on. Even parenting moves from control to a level of influence, physical, you know, physical uh, child that you'd be raising up, a birth child, someone that where you say, well, you've got to do this, and you can take the child because they're small enough, and you can move them to where they need to be. And as they get older, they get bigger. And as they get older, you have to move out of the control phase and into the influence phase, which means you're letting them now grow into who Jesus has created them to be. It's interesting. We see children grow from infant to about age 10, and we're saying, go, 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 walk, you can do it. Come on, pick that up, you can do it. Come on, feed yourself, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. Then they hit 10 or 11, and all of a sudden we're going, hold on. They're going, oh, can I do this? Can I do that? And we're trying to rein them back in. And the reality is now they're ready to try new things. My wife thought I was crazy. I let my son sit in the driver's seat of my car. It's not a big car. It's like a Hot Wheel. 
and so it's not like you're really going to cause any damage. You know, it goes zero to 60 in a weekend, so it's really not a big deal. And so he sat in my car, and this is an 11-year-old, right? And he's just driving down the driveway, right? And we have a little joke because I was teaching him how to stop. And you know how kids stop a car when they do it for the first time? It's like an emergency brake, right? And so we, we tease, right? We call it a Trevi stop. And so we just, but he's grown beyond that because he's done it since. He drives his papal's tractor. Like he's doing these bigger things. He's on a big four-wheeler that looks way too big for him, but he has full control of it. Now I want him to move into his own even at 11 years old, he needs to start managing what he can manage with me giving him and Shelly giving him influence. Not to say that we can control the other two girls. <laughs> no, no, no. But anyway, so we've got you going from dead, infant, child, young adult. Now, the, the goal is to move into a spiritual parent where you're actually leading, by, where you're always leading by um, example, but you're more in influence. The parent is now influencing one, right? So you're, this is kind of you and them. You're, 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 you're parenting somebody uh, that you've grown into, and you're influencing culture together. So now you have these two parents that are working together to influence culture. And now the person that you have raised in the faith is a parent, and now that person needs to be finding somebody to be growing and discipling. Where are you? If you're not real, if you're not raw about it, you're just going to stay fake. So you may have thought, I'm, I'm just going to be real with you. You may have thought, oh, I'm totally a parent. Okay, so who are you discipling and how are you influenced culture in Jesus' name? Oh, well, maybe I'm a young adult. Okay, so that means because you're becoming confident in who you are in Christ, becoming the mission you're actually reaching and, and, and you're doing and you're giving and you're blessing and, and you're becoming whole. Oh, man, okay. Maybe I'm a child. Maybe I'm a child. Maybe I'm a child and I'm still trying to connect to God's purpose, connect to God's family, and connect to God. It's my responsibility to equip and to guide and if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you need to go. And so be on the lookout for this discipleship of the, the path of the disciple because it's something that's going to just characterize community life as we come together and we're a blessing to each other. Listen, we can grow together. We can grow together. We're going to be on different wavelengths. We're going to be on different paths perhaps, but we can grow together together. That's the whole big idea for today, is that we can actually grow together. I'm going to grow at my pace. You're going to grow at your pace. In some cases, sometimes people pass somebody. And you know what? That's not a shaming thing. That's just reality. So here's our next steps. Here's how we're going to process this. Where do you need to grow in your, in your life? Think about it. Where do you need to grow? If you're having, if you're having uh, trouble being obedient in your giving, and maybe it's a budgetary problem, so then you reach out to somebody to help manage your, your budget to be able to work through those details. And so you need to work through that. Maybe you're, maybe you're, you know what, in this season right now where we are, where you need to grow is try to figure out how to manage all the things that the world is throwing at you right now. Because you had a full-time job and a full-time life. Now some are being full-time teachers. And the full-time teachers are now being in-class te room teachers and online teachers. Man, how do I grow to where I need to be? You know what? You need to find out where you need to grow. And then I want to encourage you to find one or two people in your life uh, to bring them into that area of your faith journey. That person may be, give you such great advice in that area, and you don't want to pass that up. Let me just pray for you and pray for me as, as we wrap up here today on what this looks like. Don't just hear it. Do it. Heavenly Father, we've just heard your word. Thank you for this letter that Paul wrote. Uh, to uh, be a blessing to the Ephesians and a challenge as well. I pray that what we have heard in the name of Jesus, that it will be locked into our minds, bodies, and spirits as we go forth. Help us to truly be the church in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you as we've been walking through this series. I'm enjoying this. I hope that this has been a blessing to you guys. Um, as we get ready to leave here, one quick thing that I want to share with you. Uh, many of you know Pastor Brenda Young. Uh, she's the senior pastor of Cornerstone Church. Uh, many of us have known, loved, been grown, raised, mentored by her. 
Well, next Sunday, August 23rd, is her last uh, Sunday as the senior pastor of Cornerstone Church. She is officially retiring, and the following week, on the 30th, there'll be an installment of Pastor Jacob, and he'll be the new senior pastor. They've been kind of co-sharing that, from my understanding, and just, you know, moving together. And so, we want to be a blessing. We truly, as a church family, want to be a blessing to Pastor Brenda. So, there's two things we're going to do. On your way out the front door... Um, there's going to be a tall table out there with cards, handmade, beautiful cards. And I want you to grab one or two, and I want you to write a note in it. You can share a memory, or you can just simply sign it, however you want to do it, but, but do it. Then bring it back to us by next week, so that way we can then mail it. The reason why we're asking to mail it ourselves is because we want to do like a trickle. A little trickle for her. Now, if you're watching online, you're not in-house, and you can't pick up those cards, totally understandable. Grab a card from around your house, or if you need us to uh, give you one, you could probably stop by during the week. We could figure that out, um, but we can get you those cards. Or if you really want to mail it yourself, that's fine. You can mail it yourself, but we're willing to do that for you. And we want to bless her, um, you know, on the 23rd and beyond uh, with the, kind of a card parade, a little bit of a card parade, so that'll be fun. Now, in, in addition to that... We're going we're gonna to really want to be a blessing to her where her passion lies. And you know, back in uh, 20, uh, 2007, the, the message that I heard was in 2006. It was a beautiful message about how people need life-giving water in the world. We know it as Clear Blue, Clear Blue Water Project. And so in 2007, Clear Blue actually became an organization that collected funds and was able to drill wells all over the world. It's been a phenomenal thing. Well, we want to be a blessing, and we want to give a, a full well of at least $1,500 in Pastor Brenda's name to Clear Blue. I believe there are people here that could even sponsor that entire well. I don't care how much we gather, we're going to give everything we gather uh, for Clear Blue in honor of Pastor Brenda, and we're going to give it to uh, Clear Blue and make sure that they're able to do uh, what they have been called to do. That's how we can bless our brothers and our sisters. And I want to invite you to do that with me, will you? Let's make sure that we make this week a great week of blessing for her as she retires. Now, will you please stand and receive the blessing of the Lord as we head out here today? Don't forget Saturday, Backpack Blessings. Check out our website or social media for more information. Now, receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face toward you and give you peace. Now go and be the church.